Blog Talk Radio. Transition. The process of change from one condition to another. We are now at a new crossroads where change is evident once again. What does not serve us must transform us anew. Returning to our original state of oneness and true nature of that which created who we truly are. Confusion was the way of the past. Enlightenment is the way of the now and future. Shedding the layers of the sea. We now bring you the transformation of the two who started as one. Our fearless planet 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 never stands stands still. still. Earth Earth has been been in a process process of transition. Not exactly exactly remarkable, ongoing reality. Welcome Welcome to Transition Radio. My name is Mark Angelo Gummings, your host. And my name is Linda Lopez, your hostess. Coming to you live yeah, from it's where? Yeah, the beautiful land of enchantment. Oh, still God, it's a lovely city. place. You it can only it. warm up. I know, it's getting there. I think we're almost at the end of the winter stage. Started in October, and it's March, and it's still cold, but it's not as bad as it was. What well, do we want to do before we start the show? Well, you know... It's always nice to thank our sponsors, and one of our sponsors, two of them actually, yeah, okay. I'll tell you about one of them right okay. now, thebreastformstore.com. They have everything you can imagine to enhance your feminizing needs. You know, and they, uh, they've been around for the longest time, An amazing sponsor. Check out their website, www.thebreastformstore.com, and you could also check out Spunk Lube an award-winning personal lubricant that's glycerin-free and 100% safe with all toys, all sex toys. And it's fun to use. Yes, it is fun to use. You might want to check them out at the website, and that is? It's at spunklube.com. Well, actually, it's www.spunklube.com. Yes, and if you use a code TR, you will receive a 10% discount, and we know how much we love to save money and we love being donated to yes of course (laughs) yes that's also a very important thing you know no pressure but if you've enjoyed the shows i mean we got a library full of interviews and now we're creating a library full of informative shows for everyone in the lgbt everyone outside the lgbt it's just an amazing uh we've opened up doors and try to bring other things because there's other things besides there are players. I mean there are other things but the fact is that we're also doing other things we're not just going to do radio we're going to move on as well and do more stuff exactly. you know I mean when it gets warmer out it makes it a little easier to shoot some TV shoot some TV and like you some, like to do yes and music videos and I know music you miss it. I do yeah but you know once it's the weather goes away, yeah. then we're definitely going to be bringing you guys amazing things and just going to blow your minds. And talking about blowing your minds, I mean, I know a lot of you have different religious beliefs. Some people believe you die, like my grandmother, God bless her soul, Jehovah Witness, believe you die, you get buried, and that was the end of that. She was, they were waiting for Armageddon to come, and all the dead people, like the movie Zombies, would come out of the grave, and then all these people that were dead before will come alive. I just I visualize like the dawn of the living dead or something when my grandmother would say that. But I'm a big believer that there is life after death and that there there are, you know, many experiences and there are many recollections of people who died and they're in the operating room and they see everything that's going on around them and they explain exactly what's going on. But we wanted to share the story that we think was pretty amazing and get you to think differently about life. The cool death. thing, though, was that this was a doctor, yes. a neurosurgeon. Who was very that. skeptical at that. Right. As we know, science and religion or science and spirituality kind of butt heads a little bit. But there's just a lot of things out there that's really opening people's eyes and hearts up. So in the fall of 2008, 
However, after seven days in a coma, during which the human part of my brain, he quotes, the neocortex was inactivated. I experienced something so profound that it gave me a scientific reason to believe in consciousness after death. I know how pronouncements like mine sound to skeptics, so I will tell my story with the logic and the language of the scientist that I am, he says. Very early one morning, four years ago, I awoke with an extremely intense headache. Within hours, my entire cortex, the part of the brain that controls thought and emotion, and that in essence makes us human, had shut down. Doctors at Lynchburg General Hospital in Virginia, a hospital where I myself worked at as a neurosurgeon, determined that I had somehow contracted a very rare bacterial meningitis that mostly attacks newborns. E. coli bacteria had penetrated my cerebrospinal fluid and were eating my brain. Very serious diagnosis there. When I entered the emergency room that morning, my chances of survival in anything beyond vegetative state were already low. They soon sank to near non-existent. For seven days, I lay in a deep coma, my body unresponsive, my higher order brain functions totally offline. Then, on the morning of my seventh day, in the hospital, as my doctors weighed whether to discontinue treatment, my eyes popped open. There is no scientific explanation for the fact that while my body lay in coma, my mind, my conscious, inner self was alive and well. While the neurons of my cortex were stunned to complete inactivity by the bacteria that had attacked them, my brain-free consciousness journeyed to another larger dimension of the universe, a dimension I'd never dreamed existed, and which the old pre coma me would have been more than happy to explain was simply an impossibility. But that dimension, in rough outline, the same one described by countless subjects of near-death experience and other mystical states, is there. It exists, and what I saw and learned there has placed me quite literally in a new world, a world where we are much more than our brains and bodies, and where death is not the end of consciousness, but rather a chapter in a vast and incalculably positive journey. It took me months to come to terms with what had happened to me, not just the medical impossibility that I had been conscious during my coma, but more importantly, the things that happened during that time. Towards the beginning of my adventure, I was in a place of clouds, big, puffy, pink-white ones that showed up sharply against the deep blue black sky, higher than the clouds, immeasurably higher, flocks of transparent, Shimmering beings arced across the sky, leaving long streamer-like lines behind them. Birds? Angels? These words registered later, when I was writing down my recollections. But neither of these words do justice to the beings themselves, which were quite simply different from anything I've known on this planet. They were more advanced. They were higher forms. A sound, huge and booming like a glorious chant came down from above, and I wondered if the winged beings were producing it. Again, thinking about it later, it occurred to me that the joy of these creatures as they soared along was such that they had to make this noise. That if the joy didn't come out of them this way, then they would simply not otherwise be able to contain it. The sound was palpable and almost material, like a rain that you can feel on your skin but doesn't get you wet. Seeing and hearing were not separate in this place where I now was. I could hear the visual beauty of the silvery bodies of those scintillating beings above, and I could see the surging joyful perfection of what they sang. It seemed that you could not look at or listen to anything in this world without becoming a part of it, without joining with it in some mysterious way. Again, from my present perspective, I would suggest that you couldn't look at anything in that world at all, for the word at itself implies a separation that did not exist there. Everything was distinct, yet everything was also a part of everything else, like the rich and intermingled designs on a Persian carpet or a butterfly's wing. It gets stranger still. For most of my journey, someone else was with me, a woman. She was young, and I remember what she looked like in complete detail. She had high cheekbones and deep blue eyes golden brown tresses framed her lovely face. When first I saw her, 
We were riding along together on an intricately patterned surface, which after a moment I recognized as the wing of a butterfly. In fact, millions of butterflies were all around us, vast fluttering waves of them, dipping down into the woods and coming back up around us again. It was a river of life and color. Moving through the air, the woman's outfit was simple, like a peasant's, but its color, powder blue, indigo, and pastel orange peach, had the same overwhelming, super vivid aliveness that everything else had. She looked at me with a look that if you saw it for five seconds would make your whole life up to that point worth living, no matter what had happened in it so far. It was not a romantic look, no. It was not a look of friendship. It was a look that was somehow beyond all these, beyond all the different compartments of love we have down here on Earth. It was something higher, holding all those other kinds of love within itself, while at the same time being much bigger than all of them. Without using any words, she spoke to me. The message went through me like a wind, and I instantly understood that it was true. I knew so in the same way that I knew that the world around us was real, was not some fantasy, passing, and insubstantial. The message had three parts, and if I had to translate them into earthly language, I'd say they ran something like this. You are loved and cherished dearly, forever. You have nothing to fear. There is nothing you can do wrong. The message flooded me with a vast and crazy sensation of relief. It was like being handed the rules to a game I'd been playing all my life without ever fully understanding it. We will show you many things here, the woman said, again without actually using these words, but by driving their conceptual essence directly into me. But eventually, you will go back. To this, I had only one question. Back where? It's interesting because the many recollections of other species, like the greys, which are supposedly genetically modified aliens, don't speak. They speak through telepathic means. There's no words coming out of the mouth. And I believe that we here on Earth are slowed down by language because language is very deceiving. I mean, you could say one word and people could interpret that one word in many different ways. Especially in English, right? Yeah, especially in English, which, you know, to me, being Cuban, you know, <laughs> it's one of those languages that... I, even reading it, it's like, unless you memorize the word, nothing yeah. sounds or looks like it should be pronounced. But anyway, it's, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie by Robin Williams, What Dreams May Come. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like that is a type of picturesque environment that he was um Super in. colorful. Yeah, I mean, he was explaining about. And it's, it's really amazing because everyone, I mean, have you ever heard, I know you're a Christian. And I know that, you know, you have your certain beliefs, but I'm sure you've heard of near-death experience, and I'm sure that you've heard what they all have, the same theme in common. Of course. And what, that, what would that theme be? Well, usually it entails seeing an old loved one, you know, someone that you were, you know, very, very much in, you know, was your family member or a father or a, a lost sister or something. Or a grandmother. Right? Or some people even claim to see several of their family members that have died come to greet them. They're almost like helping you make it to the other side safely so that you're not fearful. Imagine you're dying and you're like, where am I? Where is this? You know, you're know, you like, you don't see your body anymore and you're right. just this cloud of dust or a cloud of smoke or whatever. And and it's a scary thing. So, yes, most of them have that same kind of recollection. It's usually someone that's been dear and close to you. Well, we wanted to share the interview that was done by ABC um, from Dr. Alexander. Take a listen. All the other afterlife stories, everybody told of being guided by a loved one who had died. You had as your guide a girl you'd never met. I must say that was very haunting. Why would I go through all that and not have my father there? My father, who was a neurosurgeon, I idolized him. And he had passed over four years earlier. Why wasn't he there? And 
why the blue-eyed girl instead? Dr. Alexander had been adopted as a child. Years later, he found his birth family, all except for one. His birth sister died before he met them. Her name was Bert. How old was she when she died? She was uh, 36 years old. So, Betsy, you'd never met? I just heard what a beautiful, loving soul she was. How she, how she worked in a, in a, a rape crisis center and took care of many people who were unfortunate. And she was just very loving, loving person. How was it that you came to see a picture of her? My first sister, Kathy, had promised to send me a picture. And it was about four months after coming out of the hospital, and that picture arrived. He opened the envelope and saw it for the first time. The photo, he said, was of that little-eyed girl on his vision. I so stunned at that picture was almost the she Do you get it? I cannot tell you how powerful that was. There was no mistaking it. That's exactly what it was. That's pretty interesting because he had never met her. He didn't know what she looked like. And for the first time, he actually saw a picture, and it was the exact same image that he saw. That is just unbelievable. I mean, when you first hear that story, it's so emotional because when they put the visual together in the story, it shows a beautiful, young, vibrant woman, and it's the same person that was in his experience, in his encounter. And, you know, like I said, there's been many encounters where people know exactly what's going on, even though they've been pronounced totally dead. They could explain exactly what the doctors are saying, what people are doing when they come back. Right. So, I mean, it, it has to be true. It has, it has to, to be true. I mean, what would be the whole logistic of being born, dying, and that's the end of that? Right. I mean, thousands of people are born, thousands of people are dying every day. And it's like, what is the purpose of it? If there, if this wasn't actually meant to be a university, a school for us spirits to grow, and then we can't... Not just to play a harp? No, it's not just no. to play a harp. No, no. I mean, it's, it's beyond what we've been taught. And I think all the beliefs that we have been taught is to instill fear and so they could control us. Because the message that this guy is bringing forth is that we are loved no matter what. We can't do anything wrong. We need to stop this guilt-ridden life that we're leading. I mean, it's crazy. Anyway, the story continues. A warm wind blew through, like the kind that spring up the most perfect summer days, tossing the leaves of the trees and flowing past like heavenly water, a divine breeze. It changed everything, shifting the world around me into an even higher octave, a higher vibration. Although I still had little language function, at least as we think of it here on earth, I began wordlessly putting questions to this wind and to the divine being that I sensed at work behind or within it. Where is this place? Who am I? Why am I here? Each time I silently put one of these questions out, the answer came instantly in an explosion of light, color, love, and beauty that blew through me like a crashing wave. What was important about these blasts was not was that they didn't simply silence my questions by overwhelming them. They answered them, but in a way that bypassed language. Thoughts entered me directly, but it wasn't thought like we experience here on earth. It wasn't vague and material or abstract. These thoughts were solid and immediate, hotter than fire and wetter than water. And as I received them, I was able to instantly and effortlessly understand concepts that would have taken me years to fully grasp in this earthly life. Each time I silently put one of these questions out, the answer came instantly in an explosion of light, color, love, and beauty that blew through me like a crashing wave. What was important about these blasts was that they did simply silence my question by overwhelming them. They answered them, but in a way that bypassed language. Thoughts entered me directly, but it wasn't though like we experience on earth. It, was, it wasn't vague, immaterial or abstract. These thoughts were solid 
am in need, hotter than fire and wetter than water. And as I received them, I was able to instantly and effortlessly understand concepts that would have taken me years to fully grasp in my earthly life. I continued moving forward and found myself entering an immense world, completely dark, infinite in size, yet also infinitely comforting. Pitch black as it was, it was also brimming over with light, a light that seemed to come from a brilliant orb that I now sensed near me. The orb was kind of an interpreter between me and this vast presence surrounding me. It was as if I were being born into a larger world, and the universe itself was like a giant cosmic womb, and the orb which I sensed was somehow connected within or even identical to the woman on the butterfly wing was guiding me through it. What happened to me demands explanation. Modern physics tells us that the universe is a unity, that it's undivided. Though we seem to live in a world of separation and difference, Physics tells us that beneath the surface, every object and event in the universe is completely woven up with every other object and event. There is no separation. And that is true. That is tremendously true. I mean, we are all, all one. We're all connected. And the well, illusion is yeah. that we're separated. It's like you said about, you know, like you say in so many times to me, is that you say that everything is connected to everything else. I mean, outside... You know, the environment that we live in, the food that we eat, um, the experiences that, that we have, they're all like real experiences that are interconnected, like our cells are all like a micro version of our whole body and that we're connected to the whole earth. I mean, it's amazing, yeah. you know. People want to check out the link to this particular um article it's i've placed it on the actual blog talk um page for today and i'll also put it on the youtube video that i put together on, on the on-demand version of the show you know there's so little that we really know about the many universes and galaxies that are out there and there is just so much more for us to learn if we stepped out of the box we could really see that we're but a peanut in the tiny, galaxy, tiny little thing. Tiny little thing. I mean, compared to the size of the sun, Earth is so minuscule. Six suns would fit inside the rings of Saturn. So give this perspective is the fact that if we just look at the sun itself, it's never going to tell us the truth. Definitely. But we found, I guess, there's some new life form, um, a planet. Yes. like the Earth. Yes. NASA has discovered another Earth-like planet orbiting a nearby star within the habitable zone using the Kepler Space Telescope, labeled as Kepler-186f. It is about 500 light years away from us in the Cygnus constellation. The habitable zone has also been referred to as the Goldilocks zone. This zone is a region around a star with, within which planets with proper atmospheric pressure are capable of supporting liquid water on their surfaces. It is estimated that there are at least 40 billion Earth-sized planets within the Milky Way. But this planet they've just discovered is the first Earth-sized planet to be discovered in the Goldilocks zone of another nearby star. Besides Kepler-186f, there's also four other planets that orbit the same star. This means that if the nearby star is similar to our sun, the potential for life on Kepler-186f exponentially increases. We know of just one planet where life exists, Earth. When we search for life outside our solar system, we focus on finding planets with characteristics that mimic the Earth, that of the Earth, said Lisa Quintana. Research scientists at the SETI Institute at NASA Ames Research Center in Montville, Field, California, and led author of the paper published in the journal Science, Finding a Habitable Zone Planet Comparable to Earth in Science is a Major Step Forward. The nearby stars have the size and mass as our sun, and Kepler-186f only receives one-third of the energy we get from our sun. Kepler-186 orbits a star once every 130 days. Although the size of Kepler-186f is known, its mass and, comp mass and composition are not. Previous research, however, suggests that a planet the size of Kepler-186f is likely to be rocky. Kepler-186f resides in the Kepler-186 system and is again about 500 light years from Earth in the constellation Cygnus. The system is also home to our four, to four companion planets which orbit a star 
half the size and mass of our sun. The star is classified as an M dwarf or red dwarf, a class of stars that makes up 70% of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. M dwarfs are the most numerous stars, said Quintana. The first sign of other life in the galaxy may well come from planets orbiting an M dwarf. On the surface of Kepler 186F, the brightest of its star at high noon, it's only as bright as our sun appears to us about an hour before sunset. Being the habitable zone does not mean we know this planet is habitable. The temperature on the planet is strongly dependent on what kind of atmosphere the planet has, said Thomas Barkley, research scientist at the Bay Area Environment. Environmental Research Institute at Ames, and co-author of the paper, Kepler 186F, can be thought of as an Earth cousin rather than Earth twin. It has many properties that resemble Earth. Amazing. You know, just when you read these stories and the people that doubt that life could possibly exist on another planet and that we are the focus. You know, like back in the day, people would talk about the Earth being revolving everything revolving around the earth but it's not it's not so you know the earth is just but a little tiny little speck in our galaxy compared to the 40 billion other earths in the milky way it's unbelievable to think yeah i wanted to share what uh, one of our chatters is writing each celestial body is in fact a home of spiritual beings evolving at a different pace and in different circumstances from humans on earth that's very true he also writes they are not physical beings in most cases but imper- imperceptible to our senses very true uh thank great. you chris yes, that's thank very you. interesting yeah it's like, you know, we think we know a lot, but we really know nothing, and we're still little babies, spiritual yeah. babies, trying to grow and, and learn things, and actually, we're making a major mess of things, I truly believe. Well, we do know that there are Martians on Mars. Oh, right? yes, and I have always said I'm from Mars, because I never really related to anybody when I was growing up. We actually have three minutes and a half of a live show, so Chris, if we cut off on you, you could uh, listen to the remainder of the show on demand. But uh, just uh, letting you know that we got three minutes and a half of the live show. Well, you probably know that Mars hasn't always been so barren, but have you wondered what it was like in its heyday? You almost wouldn't recognize it, actually. According to the international team of scientists, they've used six years of atmospheric monitoring to determine that Mars had enough water to form a big but shallow, one-mile-deep ocean that covered almost half of the northern hemisphere for billions of years ago. The planet would have been dis- decidedly blue in places. You sadly aren't likely to ever see Mars in that state again. Since most of the water was lost to space, it's also possible that there was, and potentially potentially still is, more water locked underground. Even so, the findings could have a tremendous effect on the search for signs of life. The sheer abundance of water hints that Mars might have been habitable for longer than first thought raising the chances that Curiosity and future rovers will find evidence of alien organisms. Interesting. Yeah. There's new and new findings every day. I mean, we're getting very close to the D word, disclosure. That's a big one. Yes. What our government may finally release as fact. Yes. The story of the rest of... The galaxy, really, I mean, that there have been access to other life forms. Yeah. What are religious people going to do then? I know it's going to freak them out, really, because, I mean, they think that, again, I think that they think that the world is flat. Yeah. And that everything (laughs) revolves around it. Yeah. You know, that everything revolves around, you know, the story in the Bible and that we're just this small little, you know, person but we actually i mean there's just so much more so So much much more more. and you know there are a lot of people that are going to have a hard time with this because they're just used to their little world and what they've been taught from the time they're little and dare anybody else step out of the box because then it's it's the devil or it's demonic or it's not good or whatever else you know that's just the default that everybody goes to that christians or the religious in history have always gone to. Yeah. to I'm going to leave you with a thought here that um, what if our creators 
okay, because I, I'm just using the word plural, because I believe we have a spiritual creator, and I think we have what I called these Elohims or the Anunnaki's that came down and messed with prime creator's creation. What if it was just this experimental species that they put together and they have actually have – that's why we're all different, you know, Chinese, black, and all sorts of different looks. They're all little experiments that have been placed in this planet. Right. What are people going to actually do when they realize that we're not created by whom they think they were created and that the gods of the Bible is not the main god, but these alien forms that are advanced that created us? It's going to be a lot of really ticked off people. Yeah. Because they're going to think, what? <laughs> Which makes perfect sense because we look at how human beings have all this anger, this this fear, this all these like really bad characteristics and attributes. I mean, if you look at what humanity has done to this planet, to each other, and we look at these really violent Vikings and, and just what Columbus did to the natives, and they say we're made in God's image. Well, our prime creator, him, her, is pure and full of love. Mm-hmm. These aliens, these species that we we'll call them angels or whatever, they don't have that same pure love and light that our prime creator has. On the contrary, they have this, they're jealous. You know how the Bible mentions God is a jealous God and God is an angry God. And Well, that characteristic fits more of these Elohims, Anunnaki's, more so than prime creator. Well, they talk about you know, one of the scriptures in the Bible says, the heart is deceitfully wicked, who can know it? I mean, it's like it paints the picture of man is recklessly in trouble, you know, because he has a heart that is bent towards evil. And yet we were born, when we were created, we are supposed to have been perfect. So how were we created perfect? And what happened that we became so unperfect? You know, that's that's crazy. I mean, that, you know, even the first two who are supposed to be perfect all of a sudden became imperfect. Why is that? I mean, people don't ask these questions. People just take what they're told by this little book that, you know. And when they realize, you know, like the Genesis account has not just one account of creation. It has two. One starts in Genesis 1. The other one starts in Genesis 2. And they do not work together. They yeah. contradict each other in so many ways, you know. And the thing is, like, in future broadcasts, we're going to be enlightening people up about these certain things, you know, that people have always bought into as being the truth. Right. And they really have been fed quite the line. Bunch of lies. There's a lot of contradictions in the Bible. There's a lot of, you know, the same story that applies to Jesus Christ applies to um, so that that <laughs> blows me away when we saw that. Yeah, you know that it applies to like another creator, who, um, another savior or messiah who was born on December twenty fifth, who died and rose again, who all that, you and know, it all kind of it, happened. Yeah. And it's all talking about astrological things that they play. It's nothing to do actually with a. But all these stories have been plagiarized throughout the years of different. Because I mean Christ. It was only, what, 2,000 years ago? I mean, the earth has been around for billions of years. There have been tribes, and there's been life on earth for and civilization. Yeah, and it's like the world just didn't start when Christ, you know? And it's it's just crazy. And I think that if we stop this religious madness and really tapped into our human side and, and forget religion, forget politics, and just learn to be Native again. Well, the interesting thing that you're saying is that no one's saying to forget being spiritual. We're right. not talking about that. No, not We're at all. We're talking about religion. Forget about the religious bent right. of how you see things right. because what you think you have accepted as being true, it just might not be. It just right. might not be. Well, guys, stay tuned for Wednesday broadcast, which will be our nutrition and um, health segment. This Friday, we have a guest. We have a musician. He's an FTM. And Los Soros, I think it's the name of the band. I don't quite uh, know the exact name of the band, but if you give me two seconds here, I'll pull it up. And um, we'll let you know what it is. 
Oh, so that good. salad was so good. Oh, I know that salad Gosh. I had today was amazing. Talking about health and, and uh, nutrition. Mm-hmm. My yeah. gosh. People only knew how good real live food is. They don't know what they're missing because, really you know, they're used to eating dried, you know, mucus-filled. Dead animals. Yeah. Milk products that just, you know, drive you to sickness. And when you eat this way, you totally are going to have a different outlook. I mean, like, when you were making it and stuff, it's not like you're cooking, anything simmering. There's not, like, some smoke that's going up or anything. It's just the scent of the vegetables and the fruits and just the scent of all the herbs and all the things that are in that salad. It's just, like, it just wakes up your senses. It's crazy. It makes you feel totally different. I mean, I did it for 13 months, and I felt amazing. I don't know why I ever stopped doing it. I'm so glad we're doing this now. I'm glad. Okay. And it's it's just it gives you a different lease on life altogether. Anyway, the guest will be called Quinn Evan, and he's a musician, and I'm looking forward to interviewing him and um, having him on the show. He's supposed to send me an MP3 and, and all that good stuff so we can get the show set up. On Friday, cool. which will be uh, an interesting thing. Like the old days. Like the old days, yeah. I like to throw in every yeah. now and then a little interview. We had Sister um, Paula Nielsen. Nielsen, yeah. And that was an interesting interview. So every now and then, we'll just, you know, we'll surprise you. You got a lot of good feedback on that show. Oh, yeah, we sure did. And she Lots was a great guest. Yes, she was. Well, anyway, guys, if you can't live your truth, then it's just not worth living. Have a great evening, and check you guys on Wednesday. See you guys. Bye.